Hi everybody, I'm Shay Simmons and today we're going to talk about fashion and the Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Movement was a struggle for social justice that took place mainly during the 1950s and 1960s for Black Americans to gain equal rights under the law in the United States. The Civil War had officially abolished slavery, but it didn't, dis it didn't end discrimination against Black people. They continued to endure the devastating effects of racism, especially in the South. By the mid-20th century, Black Americans had more than enough of prejudice and violence against them. They, along with many white Americans, mobilized and began, to, began an unprecedented fight for equality that spanned two decades. Let's see how fashion was before, during, and after the Civil Rights Movement. So let's take a look at how civil rights, the Civil Rights Movement affected fashion. In the beginning, there was something called the European look. Before and during the Civil Rights Movement, Blacks felt the need to look more European. So they straightened their hair. To achieve this look, they used chemical relaxers or a pressing comb. And for those who don't know what a pressing comb is, it's a comb that we heat up on the stove to straighten our hair. And it's similar to like a flat iron. It's just more precise. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Or they simply wore wigs. They did this because it was the way of fitting in and being accepted. During the movement, they, some not all, decided it was time to stop the need of the European look and reclaim their heritage. That's when the Afro became more mainstream, which we will talk about later. And you can see here a few pictures of some of the women who wore wigs or straightened their hair during that time. Dorothy Dandridge, Eartha Kitt, Diana Ross and the Supremes. Next, we're going to talk about the man himself and his wife, Martin Luther King. During the civil rights era, the Sunday best was a look de rigueur at nonviolent protest. Appearing polished and pulled together brought a serious undertone to the proceedings and demanded that the activists be taken seriously as citizens. The Sunday best included a suit for the men and a dress, usually A-line, for the women, and both in hats, as you can see in this picture. Here is Coretta Scott and Martha Luther King. Um, amazing people. <clears throat> Next, we're going to talk about you guessed it, the Afro. Once the marches got on their way, everyone was in their Sunday best. Sadly, the police decided to prevent the marches by hosing them down with water. One thing you need to know about black women and their hair is never mess with it. If you had your hair pressed or straightened and water hits it, that's all she wrote. And because of this, they started wearing their natural hair. Of course, it was also because they decided to embrace their roots by letting go of the European look they held on to so fiercely. It was now time for the next style. It was called the Afro. Here's a few options. I thought, here's Diana Ross, if anybody knows who Diana Ross is. Next, we're going to talk about something I had no clue about until I did this research. It was originally a poor quality cloth, most often made of cotton linen, or hemp that was used by slaveholders to clothe their enslaved. The cloth was sewn into simple but durable workwear by slaves themselves. At the time, this was a cloth. At the time, this cloth was known as slave cloth, and it was unfit for anyone else to wear except for slaves. Even the blue indigo color that we think of when we envision denim has surprising origins. It was made from a natural dye from an indigo fiora tinctura, not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, plant that is indigenous to West Africa in the seven, to, <clears throat> excuse me, indigenous to West Africa. In the 1700s, as the slave trade grew, knowledge of the plant and its cultivation traveled from West Africa to the United States with the enslaved. Before sugar, before cotton, indigo was the most profitable crop in parts of the South. 
so much so that it was once even used as currency. The slave trade was fed on both denim and indigo, and thus the history of the iconic blue jean is forever connected to slavery and the history of African dysphoria. Did anyone else know about this? If you did, let me know in the comments. Next, we're going to talk about kente cloth. Kente cloth was first captured was first captured the attention of the African Americans in 1958 when Ghana's first president, President Kwame Nkrumah, visited Washington, D.C. wearing kinte. Photos of the president adorned several newspapers and magazine covers, helping to establish the African cloth as a symbol of African pride and identity. The kinte cloth colors have different meanings. Black was the most significant and an incorporated color of the kente represented spiritual strength and maturity. Red symbolizes blood and political passion and strength. Blue stands for peace, love, and harmony. Yellow or gold represented wealth and royalty. Green means growth, harvest, and renewal. White symbolized purity, cleansing, rights, excuse me, purity, cleansing rights, and festive occasions. Purple or maroon represented Mother Earth healing and protection from all evil. Learn something new every day, don't we? And one of the things that spawned from kente cloth was something called a daishiki. The daishiki is a color garment. It's a, excuse me, it's a colorful garment for men, <coughs> excuse me, for men and women worn mostly in West Africa. The name daishiki is from the Yoruba dashiki, a loan word from the Husana dashiki, literally meaning shirt or inner garment. As compared to the outer garment, which is a baban riga, which I'm pretty sure I pronounced that wrong too. <clears throat> excuse me, you guys. Getting over a cold, so please excuse me. Much like the kente cloth, the dashiki originated in Africa. Generally made from kente cloth, it was a symbol of African Americans reclaiming their heritage. In the 1960s, the dashiki made its appearance in American culture when Jason Binning, along with Milton Clark, Howard Davis, and William Smith began to, began to mass produce its unisex garment under their new breed clothing line. They were based out of Harlem, New York. It then became a symbol of affirmation to the struggle of African Americans in the USA and a signifier of black pride and a reclamation of their African roots and identity. Next, we're gonna talk about some influencers. The movement spawned quite a few famous activists who also influenced the fashion, who also influenced fashion. Here's a picture of Angela Davis. She became famous for not only her activism, but also for her look. She had an impressive afro, I must say. And in these pictures, she's wearing a mini skirt or mini dress. In those days, it was not widely accepted. So she was definitely a rule breaker in more ways than one. I have some information on my work side of the page. You can take a look at to, to learn more about her. Next, we're going to talk about another influencer of fashion. Her name was Nina Simone. She was an activist, much like Angela Davis, and a soul singer. Her fashion influenced many styles. She's in a few different styles. She's here in a few different styles. She wore on and off stage. She was known for her head wraps, gowns, and everyday wear. You kind of see uh, a lot of women nowadays are wearing these head wraps again, right? Pretty cool how the fashion is making its rounds and coming back again. Next, we're gonna talk about a militant group called the Black Panthers. And no, I don't mean the movie or Wakanda. I mean Black Panthers from the 1960s. Though the Black Panthers were not comfortable with the commodification of the kente cloth, they themselves significantly influenced American fashion and popular culture with their revolutionary attire. The founders of the Black Panther Party, which Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, developed a uniform for the Black Panthers, 
for the, excuse me, for the Black Panther members to adorn. This uniform included a black leather jacket, powder blue shirt, black pants, black shoes, black beret, and the optional pair of black gloves. Here you see them all dressed up wearing their signature black beret and leather jacket. Still kind of uh, fashion today. We, I wear berets all the time. I don't know if anybody knows me. I think Tamara does. I wore my beret all the time. I still wear it today. Actually, I wore it yesterday. And I used to have a leather jacket, but had to get rid of it because, yeah, it was getting old. So I donated it to Goodwill. Next, we're going to talk about the Nation of Islam. They were known for their iconic look. The men of Islam, excuse me, the men of Nation of Islam wore dark suits and mostly notable was their bow tie. Major changes occurred in the Nation of Islam in the 1960s. Scandal surrounded Elijah Muhammad, integration following civil rights legislation, and the assassination of Malcolm X. Renamed al-Jihad Malik Ashabaz before his death. All contributed to the slow delegitimization of some of the beliefs and practices of the Nation of Islam. When Elijah Muhammad died, Malcolm X, in 1975, he passed leadership on to his son, Wallace Muhammad. So in conclusion, African-Americans fought to be treated as everyone else. The civil rights movement spawned many looks, from the Sunday best to wearing all black. There was those who maintained that Sunday best look, like Dr. Martin Luther King and his wife, Coretta those who changed to become closer to their heritage, those who changed to due to their newfound religion, and lastly, those who finally started loving their natural hair and color of their skin. African Americans have influenced fashion throughout the ages. I'm sure they will continue to now and in, and definitely into the future. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to walk on this journey with me through the civil rights movement and how it changed fashion. Here you see a work cited page. So if any of you want to take a look at some of the information that I found, be my guest. And thanks again for taking the time to watch my presentation.